Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to come over to talk, share with you the experience of Hong Kong. And uh, I know that I am running short of time because I think we only have a few minutes to spare. Now, first of all, I think uh, uh, Ricky had already mentioned very well about why we want to study density, right? First of all, because we have a growing urban population. Just like in China, for example, in the next um, 10 to 20 years or so, we will be having another 200 million people going to cities, right? So how can we accommodate them? 200 million, you know, is uh, similar to the size of America. And also we are having, uh, talking about this sustainable development. We are talking about compact cities, right? By being compact, so you need to increase your density. This is the issue. Now, when we talk about the high density development, obviously, as uh, pointed out by Ricky, Hong Kong may be one of the extreme case of high density development. There are a lot of advantages. For example, you can save land, save the environment, uh, you can minimize your infrastructure costs, uh, you can shorten your travel distance, as mentioned by some of the you know, uh, residents living in the high density environment. Obviously, because of that, you can save energy costs. And also, you can, because of the high density, you can support this mass transit system and promote low carbon cities. So there are a lot of advantages. But looking over here, uh, this is as early as 1989. I think people working in sustainable development obviously recognize the work of um, Peter Newman as well as um, Ken Worthy. And then uh, Hong Kong is uh, somewhere over here, right? in terms of the lowest in terms of uh, consumptions, in terms of energy. And this is because of the, also the high density that we are having, right? But when we are looking at the density, well, this is Hong Kong. I think we have been seen this many times before. Uh, like uh, Secretary Zhao talked about, you know, we have a 40% country parks. We have uh, actually 70% non-built area. Well, well, in terms of density, what does it mean? Well, in density, we have to talk about uh, many issues. One of the very important issues is what is known as the modifiable area unit problem in our, you know, uh, well, in geography. For example, you know, in the whole of Hong Kong, in the overall density, we were talking about 6,400 people per square kilometers because we have a lot of open space, right? Because of that, we condense a lot of people to this urban area to 20,000 people. Looking at the Hong Kong area, maybe 110,000 uh, people. But when you go to sweet block, one of these you know, slides that we have shown, it can be as high as 400,000 uh, uh, persons per, per square kilometers. But obviously there are reasons why, right? Uh, today, because of the time, I'm not going to talk about the reasons why. There are a lot of reasons, right? The other thing is that obviously, of this high density as being discussed, you have a lot of uh, social pathology and also crowding or crowdiness. There was a lot of research in the 1960s and the 1970s about the effect of density on social pathology. At that time, because America having building a lot of skyscrapers, they would like to see whether they can put a lot more people there, right? So they do these type of studies. But eventually, despite all the work, it is not conclusive saying that there is a direct relationship between density and social pathology. But since 1970, very few people worked on that again, right? Maybe perhaps the work by, uh, the present work may be something we are resurrecting the type of, you know, problem that we are facing, right? And um, basically, when we talk about density, uh, there is no direct relationship. And crowdiness or crowding is a psychological feeling only. And there is a lot of, you know, Chinese culture can tolerate high density as uh, being studied by Robert Mitchell in the 1960s and also early 1970s in uh, Hong Kong and Taipei, right? And one of the things is that in terms of environmental psychology, when we're looking at the, you know, men and the urban environment, right? First of all, you have the human being over there and the human being is have a, lit, a lot of different attributes, like the different social economic background, the age, the culture, they have a room environment, they have a flat, the building, the street block, neighborhood, district, and city, et cetera. So different environment you're interacting with, and you have different types of you know, uh, feeling about the whole thing, about how you move. If you move very slowly, very crowded, then you feel very crowded, right? And the environment, if you, for example, if you live in a small room, but you have a very large garden outside, you still do not feel crowded, uh, things like that, right? And then also talking about open space, 
the community facilities and the management side, as well as the design and the aesthetics environment. These are all very important, right? And so how can we uh, try to mitigate the uh, feeling of crowdedness? If we, for example, have to accept density, high density, but what can you do in terms of planning, design, and management? Uh, so you can talk about you know, the interior design, the exterior designs of the buildings and the sites, uh, just like in the case of Hong Kong. Uh, you can, first of all, like in the case of Hong Kong, uh, you try to make the traffic move uh, smoother. Uh, and also in the case of Hong Kong, why we have such a high percentage of people using public transport is mainly because we have so-called transport demand management. We try to curtail the number of cars. On the other hand, we provide public transport. This is the reason why we can achieve it, because it is intentional, right? It's urban management. And also, we have to have a clean and well-managed living and working environment, just like this hall, although it seems to be very, a lot of people, but you do not feel crowded, because it's a very nice environment, right? And also, the social economic background helps, as well as uh, Hong Kong is very being successful in uh, reducing the feelings of crowdedness through a lot of planning, design, as well as management issues. Now, look at here. Is it high density? How about this one? Is it high density, right? So when we talk about density, it's not only talking about population density, we also have to really talk about the building density as well, right? Over here in Morocco, I think this density may be only one hundredth of the times of the density over here. So we have to talk about, you know, in terms of building density, right? If there's a fixed amount of the floor area, you can have it higher, or taller, right? I think we have already mentioned that. And then you can have this shared space so everybody can have a little bit uh, better environment, uh, sharing, although you cannot afford a lot of space internally. I think space is actually affordability issue. It's not whether you have a space or not, whether you can afford it or not, right? In the case of Hong Kong, I've been talking to um, Professor Ho in Singapore. I say, well, in Hong Kong, our normal, uh, a lot of average uh, flat size is only around 200 square feet. I say, well, is that small? It's like a hotel room, right? But it is really, it house a family of four. Actually, this is already considered to be quite high in some uh, area, right? And so this is the issue. Another very important issue is that the perception issue, right? Uh, we have done some studies about, you know, the comparisons between, you know, how people perceive to be a tall building or, you know, what is tall building, right? You don't look here. In the case of Hong Kong, we can only say, well, anything above 60 story high, we say it's very tall. But in Singapore, people only say about 50 story high. What makes the difference? Because of the environmental setting. When you're used to a very dense environment, uh, obviously, you would like, you know, you are adjusted to it. Right? So it's an adjustment issue also involved, right? And Hong Kong has been very lucky because also we have a very nice harbor, and so somehow we can use the harbor as a briefing space, like the Central Park of uh, uh, um, uh, New York or the High Park in London. Now, I'm going to go through very quickly some of the measures in Hong Kong in reducing cloudiness. There are a lot of other examples, but I just want to highlight some of the main ones, right? For example, right, this is the, uh, in a high density environment, this is what you normally happen, right? The cars and the street and the people are trying to, you know, fight uh, 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 in terms of the use of space. Now, so in the case of Hong Kong, we build up a very sophisticated pedestrian flyover, right? That you can take you, you know, actually don't have to go down to the uh, ground to reach you from A to B. And also we do make use of uh, high tech, like this type of travel later and uh, you know, uh, the uh, escalator, et cetera. And another thing that we do is what we call uh, creating space out of limited space. For example, here you've got a rooftop garden and you've got a, you know, a basement for car park and so you make use of every inch of the space. And also we make use of the street. Uh, for example, this is the in central, you know, near the uh, electrical, uh, the old electrical, right? This is the uh, daytime or, you know, during the weekday. And in the, uh, uh, you know, Sunday, it's all totally being used and mainly by the uh, overseas uh, domestic helpers. Another thing that we are doing is to convert private space into public space. Uh, this is the Foster, uh, um, the Hong Kong Bank building, right? So underneath it, it's supposedly to be private. But now it's somehow they open the space and now it becomes a public space. And also through this type of, you know, large scale um, uh, housing projects, which I don't think you have something comparable in, uh, in London or in other cities, basically because of the large size, 
Then through proper design, you can have a lot of co uh, community facilities to making people feel very comfortable. And also interiorly, we can also decorate it. For example, even having a very tall ceiling and also a sort of space, this is a landmark, uh, you are welcome to walk over, or even specific place, actually you see this type of same development because it's by the same developer. And so even inside, you feel very comfortable. And one very important thing about density management is that you really need to have really professional housing management. Uh, that makes the place clean and people live more comfortably. In a lot of cities, that is failing is because of the poor housing management or the poor urban management or those the same density. Uh, and also we have to talk about clean Hong Kong and also try to educate people to behave in you know, a high density environment. Like in Japan, they are very well behaved. In Hong Kong, we have to do a lot of education. Uh, obviously, there are problems with the war effects. I, I think we talk about that, about ventilations. But obviously, uh, we are trying to um, uh, deal with it through some sort of a, a better building design to foster a quality and a sustainable building environment. For example, to avoid these shake hand uh, projects, right? In the future, uh, we are trying to see whether we can have this type of building setback so that the, the you know, distance between buildings will be better than uh, the f cases in some shape or where people shake hand. In the future, they cannot shake hand again, right? Uh, and then you can also have a sitting setbacks. And so the final conclusion I would like to say is that, you know, a high density living environment um, is more demanding uh, than the low density living environment if you want to do it properly. It's not a lot of cities can do it successfully and Hong Kong is one of the few examples. A small planning and management era will affect a lot of people. This is the problem, right? And a good urban environment cannot totally rely on good planning. So think, don't blame it all on the planner, right? We have to work together with uh, uh, different departments, uh, uh, good management, housing management, as well as educating the people, right? It's very important, right? So you need to good management as well as ed education. So better planning, design, and management can reduce the negative impacts of high density living. I'm not suggesting Hong Kong is the model. I, I think it is one of the extreme model, but at least it demonstrates under this extreme high density environment, we're still able to create a quite a good uh, living environment. Thank you.